Take your Bible this morning and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 1. We are introduced in this little book to a runaway prophet, a man who refused to listen to God. When God told him to go one way, he decided to say, no, thank you, and he went exactly the other way. And so we see here the story of a runaway prophet and the foolishness of trying to run from God. Now today, we're looking at one verse in this story, verse 17 of chapter 1. If you'll stand with me as we honor God's Word, we look at verse 17 together. Now, the Lord, you know, really those three words are all we need. Now, the Lord. Amen? What a sermon in just those three words. That fits any circumstance or situation in life we'll face. Now, the Lord. Now, the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we thank you for the story of Jonah and we thank you that you loved him enough to prepare a great fish for him and to show him through your discipline, your love. And we ask you to teach us today from this one verse about how much you love each of us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And God's people said, Amen. thank you. Please be seated. The problem that most people have with the book of Jonah is the part about the great fish. In fact, for years, skeptics have mocked and scoffed at the thought of a man being swallowed by a fish and spending three days and three nights inside that fish and then living to tell about it. Yet it may be surprising this morning to know that there are numerous records throughout history of individuals that have been swallowed by great fish and live to tell about it. Did you know that? Many years ago in Pasadena, California, there was a Bible teacher by the name of Grace Kellogg. Grace Kellogg wrote a book entitled The Bible Today. And in her book, she undeniably proves that it is possible for a man to be swallowed by a great fish and live. There are many examples of it in her book, historically documented. I'm going to give you just a few. I think you'll find these interesting. There are at least two known monsters of the deep that could have easily swallowed Jonah. One is a sulfur bottom whale, and the other is the whale shark. Neither of these sea creatures have any teeth, and they feed in a very interesting way. They open their enormous mouths, submerge their lower jaw, and rush through the water at a terrific speed. Then they strain out the water and swallow whatever is left. A sulfur bottom whale, 100 feet long, was captured in 1933 off of Cape Cod. His mouth was about 12 feet wide. So he could have swallowed a man. In fact, he could have swallowed a horse. That would have been no problem. And these whales have four to six compartments in their stomach, and any of these compartments are large enough to hold several human beings. And in addition to that, the head of this particular whale has a storage chamber in it. It's an enlargement of his nasal cavity, and it measures seven feet high, seven feet wide, and 14 feet long. I could even stand up inside of that. <laughs> and so if a whale like that has an unwelcome guest on board, he swims to the nearest land and gets rid of the offender just like he did Jonah. In the Cleveland Plain Dealer, there was an article written by Dr. Ransom Harvey who said that a dog was lost overboard from a ship and was found in the head of a whale like that six days later alive and barking. Isn't that amazing? Frank Bullen, who wrote The Cruise of the Catholot, told about a shark 
15 feet in length that was found inside the stomach of a whale. And he says that when dying, the whale would eject the contents of its stomach. Dr. Dixon stated in a museum in Beirut, Lebanon, that there is a head of a whale shark big enough to swallow the largest man that history could ever record. So it's not foolish to think this story is true. When the Bible says Jonah was swallowed by a great fish, I believe that. And when it says God prepared that great fish, I believe that. These facts show us that Jonah could have easily been swallowed by a great fish. In fact, there was a French scientist, M. de Parvel, who wrote about a man named James Bartley in the region of the Falcon Islands near South America, who they thought had drowned at sea. Two days after his disappearance, the sailors caught a whale. And when it was cut up, they found him inside that whale He was unconscious, but he was still alive. He revived, and he enjoyed the rest of his life after that adventure. Dr. Harry Rimmer, president of the Research Science Bureau of Los Angeles, wrote about another case in the Literary Digest. He noted the account of an English sailor who was swallowed by a gigantic whale shark in the English Channel. And very briefly, the account stated that in the attempt to harpoon that monstrous fish, that one of the men fell overboard. And when he fell overboard, and they were preparing to to try to rescue him, what happened was this big whale came along and and swallowed him and, and swam away. They finally were able to harpoon the fish and found the man alive inside some days later. And this man for a long time was known by Guinness records as the Jonah of the 20th century. And he actually went around and and made talks about his experience. And it is said that the gastric juices of the whale washed over this man and he lost all of his hair, his eyebrows, his hair on his head, and it turned his skin patchy orange. And can you imagine this? Jonah When Jonah hit the ground running, he looked like an orange man with no hair. (laughs) And everywhere that he went, people came to see him because he looked so funny. And they wanted to know, who is this weird orange guy that's coming through town today? That's His eyebrows are gone and he has no hair on his head. And God used that to let Jonah get a crowd so that he could preach the gospel on his way to Nineveh. Isn't that something? God can, can use a fish. And in this particular story, we, we see exactly that. Adrian Rogers used to say if God wanted to, he could have created a fish with five rooms of furniture in it. God can do anything. I mean, the Bible says, is anything too hard for the Lord? Not at all. Jesus certainly believed it. I read to you last week where Jesus believe that Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days. But this story of Jonah is not about a fish. It's about a man and his relationship with God. And this particular verse that we're looking at today is about the discipline of God in the life of one of his children. Look at verse 17. It says very distinctly that God prepared this fish. Just like God prepared the storm, by the way. God was correcting Jonah. God was teaching Jonah through the process of discipline. And the important thing here is not the fish. The important thing is the God who prepared the fish. So don't miss the story. It's not about the fish. It's about God. Can you say amen? And here we see some things that God did for Jonah through this fish. In fact, you read this story over and over again. It says God prepared things for Jonah. He prepared a storm. Then he prepared a fish. Then he prepared a gourd. Then he prepared a worm. And finally, he prepared an east wind. 
So this story is about a loving God who prepares what is best for us, even when he has to discipline us in order to correct us. Now let's look at some of the reasons God prepared this fish. In chapter 2, if you'll turn there, there is a prayer of Jonah. And this prayer tells us what Jonah was thinking while he was in the belly of this fish. Now imagine yourself in the belly of that fish. And what are you thinking? Well, in this prayer, we see exactly what Jonah was thinking. Look at chapter chapter 2, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the fish's belly. I believe it was time for him to pray, don't you? I mean, he ought to have been praying a long time before that. Look at what he said. Verse 2. I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Can you say amen? amen? When you pray, God hears and God answers. And look at what he prayed. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried and you heard my voice for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Yet I will again, I will look again toward your holy temple. That's a prayer of faith. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Then look at what he said in verse 7. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered my Lord. I remembered the Lord. I'm talking to somebody this morning, somebody sitting in here, somebody sitting in the Christian Life Center, and your soul faints within you because of something going on in your life. You're hurting and you're afraid and you don't know which way to turn and you don't know what to do and you're afraid that things are not going to turn out so good. I want you to look at what Jonah said. When my soul, verse 7, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. Dear friend, remember the Lord. When your soul faints within you, remember the Lord. And look at what he said, and my prayer went up to you. Into your holy temple, those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you. With the vow of thanksgiving, I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Why did God prepare this fish for Jonah? Number one, to save his life. He prepared this fish in order to save his life. And that's exactly what we see in this prayer. God could have let Jonah drown. But God was not dealing with Jonah out of anger. He was dealing with Jonah out of love. And God sends this great fish to save Jonah's life. Why did God prepare this fish? Or was it to punish him? Not at all. It was to correct him. Chastisement is never a punishment. It is a correction. God never chastens his children to punish them. He always chastens us to correct us. His discipline is not punitive. His discipline is for our good and our correction. In fact, all of our punishment, listen to me, all of our punishment was put upon Jesus on the cross. Do you know that? Jesus took my punishment. Jesus took all that Satan would like to throw at us. On the cross. And so the discipline of God is not to punish us, it is to correct us, to give us, to to bring us back in line with God's will. Just as when we discipline our children, it is not to hurt them, it is to help them. And so it was with Jonah, and so it is with us. The fish did not swallow Jonah to punish him but to transport him back to the very place where God wanted him to be to start with to get him in the will of God. 
Here's a second reason, and that is to get him back in God's will. That's why God prepared this fish. Jonah was trying to go as far away as he could from Nineveh, and so God let this fish pick him up and take him to the very place that God told him to go to start with. If you look at verse 10 of chapter 2, you'll see that the fish vomited Jonah out on dry ground. His ride back was a lot more interesting than his ride out. <clears throat> Those large whales, if you read about them, you'll find that they ingest great qualities of air and they retain it for long periods of time. And the God prepared this fish, the Bible says. The Hebrew word used for prepare is only translated this way in the book of Jonah where it says God prepared this fish. And it is a word that means in intricate design and planning. In other words, God mapped out every detail. God knew exactly what he was doing when he sent that fish because God was trying to get Jonah back in God's will. Centuries later, God commissioned another fish. You remember in the New Testament, he commissioned a, a smaller fish, this time not to swallow a man, but to swallow a coin. You remember that? And retained that coin long enough to provide it for Jesus when it was required taxes of the government in his day. And in Matthew 17, the followers of Jesus, you remember what they said? The Bible says they declared, even the wind and the sea obey him. Not only the wind and the sea, but the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea obey him because he made them. So why should it be surprising to us? God needed to get Jonah to Nineveh, get him back in the, the will of God. And the fastest way to get him there was to travel by Well Express. And that's exactly what God did. He got him right back in the center of his will. Here's the third reason I believe God prepared this fish. He prepared this fish to convict Jonah of his sin. To convict Jonah of his sin. You see, Jonah had a heart problem. Jonah did not want to preach the love of God to the people and the judgment of God to the people of Nineveh. He was afraid for his own life, but there was a deeper problem than that. Jonah hated the Ninevites. He was prejudiced in his heart. There was deep, bitter hatred in his heart toward these Ninevites because the Ninevites had been cruel to Jonah's people. So what is God doing here? God first has to deal with the hatred in Jonah's heart before God can do anything of significance with him. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. God has to do the same in our heart. If we are walking around with hatred in our heart, one of two things is wrong. Either we're not saved or we're backslidden, but we're not saved and in the will of God with hatred in our heart. If you hear me, say amen. I mean, you need to search your heart this morning. If you're walking around with prejudice in your heart or hatred in your heart, because God will never do anything significant with us until we get rid of that. And God may send well along. He may prepare a fish in your life to help you get back in the center of his will. He did this to convict Jonah of sin. Think about how this must have been. <clears throat> Inside that fish, all the slime. Can you imagine that? I bet he couldn't stand up. I mean, think about trying to walk on fish guts all the time. Slick and slimy. And what about the stench? Woo! I bet he never went to the fish camp again. <laughs> Couldn't stand the smell. The stinking fish. No sound inside that whale except the gastric juices of the fish flopping back and forth, back and forth, and then washing over Jonah. And think about the dark, pitch dark in the belly of that whale. Pitch dark. He had nowhere to go. He had nothing to do except to listen to God. And there are times 
when God has to put us flat on our backs in order to get our attention. That's what we see here. God is convicting him of sin. And God will do the same for you and me. Now, I want to show you something else here. You see, God was also trying to return Jonah to usefulness, to return him to usefulness. And that's why God disciplines us. It's it's God's love for us that causes him to discipline us. If, If God had not loved Jonah, God would have just let him drown. But God goes to great lengths for us because he loves us. And he wants to return us to usefulness. There was a story told about a little boy who one day was out at a pond playing with a homemade boat in the water. The boat got away from the little boy, drifted out too far into the middle of the pond, and the boy couldn't get his boat. And a man came along, and he saw what had happened, so he picked up some stones And he began throwing the stones out beyond the boat. Now, the little boy thought the man was trying to hit his boat. He didn't understand. But what the man was trying to do was to throw the stones on the other side of the boat, and the ripples in the water would then push the boat back to the shore so the little boy could could get the boat. And you know, that's exactly how God disciplines us in our lives. When we look at it, we may think he's throwing stones, but he's not throwing stones at us because God loves us. Instead of throwing stones at us, he may cast those stones beyond us and let the ripples just bring us right back to where we need to be, to a place of usefulness. That's our God. That's how he loves us. Well, what did Jonah do? He finally surrendered himself to God. He asked the sailors to cast him into the sea. You might think, well, how could he, how could he make such a request? Was he suicidal? No. Was he self-destructive? No. You see, Jonah recognized that his life was not his own, and 800 years later, Jesus put it like this in Mark chapter 8, 35. Listen to what Jesus said. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. So when Jonah said, throw me in, he was flinging himself on the mercy of God. He was saying, I'm in over my head here and I'm just going to trust God to do what God wants to do. And so he flung himself on the mercy of God. That's what somebody here needs to do this morning. You're in over your head. You're in too deep. You can't turn around. You can't fix it. You're overwhelmed. And you can't see a way out. And the only way out is for you to fling yourself upon the mercy of God through Jesus Christ. So today, we invite you to receive Christ as your Savior As we stand in a moment to sing, I'm going to ask you here in the worship center and in the Christian Life Center to come forward. If you would like to receive Christ today as your Savior, I'm going to ask you to step forward and come and just say, Pastor, today I want Jesus in my life. You come as we sing. Jesus, thank you for the whales you send our way to get us in the center of your perfect will. In Jesus' name, amen. As we stand and we sing.